Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first workshop of our spring semester. Uh, this one, we will be going over Unity Editor Tools, which is some super cool stuff. Uh, it can really help improve your Unity workflow, uh, help you get stuff done really, really fast, um, and much uh, less painless, ma less painfully. Uh, so before we get started off, go to this URL, which, sorry, you guys just have to type in. Uh, and download the zip file from there. It contains a little bit of code and some test cases. Uh, so this provided code zip is uh, one class that does RGB to HSV conversions, which are brand new in Unity, uh, so, but we didn't have it for a long time, so wrote that one up. Uh, and some test cases for us to put them through. Okay, uh, so what are editor tools? Um, yeah, so I don't really have a slide set, sorry, but uh, real quickly, editor tools are uh, things in the Unity editor that make uh, making games with Unity even easier, uh, and it lets you customize what you do in Unity. Uh, you can really sort of like how Unity has a bunch of components that you can make your own stuff for and make a game out of that. Unity editor tools are sort of like one level higher, where you can make uh, new interfaces for you, for you to use. So a couple common things are making sliders for UI, making a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, you can actually make tons and tons of stuff uh, all the way up to uh, tile map editors, which I've made a couple of in Unity. Uh, it makes it really helpful. Um, one of the biggest assets of making your own level editors in Unity is it's integrated with the code you have already, and you can make it so uh, your programmers don't have to build all your levels. You can hand it off to a level designer and say, hey, play with this tool that I made, make some levels. Uh, the tool may take you like two or three days to make, but after that, building levels will take so much less time and you won't uh, have to put your programmers on it. So, is everyone good? Everyone got that zip downloaded? Okay, we've got our color conversion.cs file and our test cases, which is just a plain old text file. So we'll go in Unity, it'll tell us it's compiling. And here we've got some test cases, which is a little, uh, two little snippets of C-sharp code and we've got our color conversion, which is a giant C-sharp class. So let's open these up. And it says it has Visual Studio, so hopefully we'll have Visual Studio. Uh, so the first thing that we're gonna be going over uh, once we get our editor started up uh, is a really nice feature of Unity that is relatively recent, but it's within uh, the 5.1 releases, so we should all have it. Um, and it's called unit testing. Um, if you're familiar with any sort of software development, you've probably heard the phrase unit tests thrown around a bunch. Um, usually unit tests are, uh, are some custom code snippets that you built that uh, run your code through a couple of preset uh, inputs and outputs and checks that all the inputs give all the correct outputs for it. Uh, so we're gonna be writing some unit tests for this color conversion class. Uh, so here we've got color conversion. We've got this function called RGB to HSV. Uh, and this takes in a color and gives us its HSV components. And we've also got our HSV to RGB, which takes in three HSV components and gives us out a color. Um, all this code is really mathy stuff, which is why I didn't want to have you guys write it, because it's super boring. Um, but this is roughly what the code should be for it. Um, and our test cases have uh, two arrays, one of which is our RGBs. So we have black, gray, white, red, and a couple colors. And then we've got their corresponding HSVs, uh, where the first one is the hue, second is the saturation, and the third is the value. Hue will range from zero to 360, and the other two will range from zero to one. So to write unit tests, we we'll first need to open our unit tests window. So just go to window, and then go to Editor Tests Runner. You can put it wherever you want. So this Editor Tests tab is all of our unit tests that we've written so far. So we don't have any as of right now, so we need to make at least one. Uh, and unit tests are part of editor scripts. Um, all editor scripts uh, use uh, the same way that we have using Unity Engine. We also have Unity Editor as a C-sharp namespace. Um, so all of our editor stuff will be saying using Unity Editor, and uh, it will also be placed in a separate uh, 
a separate assembly than our main Unity project because we don't want this stuff compiled into our game later when we ship it. Uh, to make sure that it stays separate, we just need to place it in a special folder called editor. So make an editor folder, go into it, and we'll make a new C sharp script and we'll call it color conversion unit tests. Uh, Unity will fill, us, fill it with some standard code for us, but we're not gonna keep it. And when we go back to Visual Studio, we just reload. And now we've got this second project called Assembly C Sharp Editor. And inside, we have our color conversion unit tests file. So here, delete all that code. And we're gonna start with using Unity Editor. Um, so Unity Editor is our great big namespace that we're gonna be using. Along with that, we're going to be using nUnit dot framework. nUnit is a very popular C Sharp unit testing framework that Unity integrated. Uh, so we, now we can use it for free without having to import any other junk. Uh, so the way that uh, nUnit works is you make one class which contains a bunch of related unit tests. Uh, and that class is going to have a tag on it. Uh, the tag will be test fixture. So let me make public class color conversion unit tests. So we've got our class, we're all ready to go. Uh, we're gonna write our very first unit test. So just put a test tag and then we can write uh, our first one is going to be RGB to ACSV. And for now, we're not going to have it do anything. We're just going to have it say, hello world. Question. Yeah. Let's make that big. All right. Uh, if we go to our editor tests, it'll show us we've got our Unity Editor Tools Workshop, which is our project, and then Color Conversion Unit Tests, which is our class, and then we've got RGB to HSV, which is our test. These little icons on the left will show you the status of the unit test. If it's a gray circle, that means you haven't run it yet, so we probably want to run it. So just click on it and run selected. If you haven't yet, you'll need to save your scene, so we'll just call it Workbench. And now that it's run, we get a green check mark there, which is awesome, because that means that our unit tests have passed. Um, of course, our unit tests don't do very much, so it's not super meaningful. Uh, so now that we've got one unit test, we can go back to our test cases here. We've got a bunch of things that we want to test. So we can just go up here, paste those in, indent them a little bit. So now we've got an array of RGBs and a corresponding array of HSVs. Uh, and if we want to test this using our unit tests, optimally we should be able to pass our RGBs to color conversion dot RGB to HSV. And the HSV that, that we get out from it should match the HSV that we have corresponding to it in the second array. So let's go ahead and write this unit test. Uh, we'll start out by doing it for just one so that we can see what one single unit test looks like. So we'll use our black for our RGB and HSV. So first we'll make three floats to contain our HSV that we get back. And then we'll call RGB to HSV, we have to give it a color first. So RGB zero, and then out H, out S, and out V. So now we've got these three HSV that we wanna check against. So we'll do assert dot R equal. This is the H component of the black. 
And then that's S and V. So what these lines do, um, assert is provided by our nunit.framework namespace. And when we say assert.r equal, it just compares the first argument and the second to see if they're equal. If they are, awesome, it'll continue forward. But if they're not, then it'll immediately fail the unit test. So this is pretty cool. We've got some substantive code in our unit test now. So we can go back to Unity. You might notice it's kind of subtle, but our unit test turned a little bit darker green and our text is kind of gray. Uh, that means that the unit test ran successfully, but has been changed since, so we need to rerun it. So just click Run Selected, and it'll give us another bright green check mark, which means that our unit test passed. Super cool. So we've got our unit test working for just one input. We want to extend this to going through all of these. So we just write a simple for loop. We'll go through all our RGBs. And on every single one, that's what we want to do. So now we're running through every single one of these test cases, just using a for loop around it. Uh, if we pass them all, we should be pretty confident that our RGB to HSV function is working super good. So again, to repeat, I said it earlier really quickly, but um, if you edit all that code and you tried it out and you hit run selected or run all and your unit test turned red with uh, no sign on it, uh, that means you did it right, good job. You found out there's a bug in the code that I wrote that I fixed and then took back out so that we can get it in unit tests. Um, so that's the whole point of unit tests. Um, even though it might look like it works for some simple cases, when you really do some like spray testing and you throw a whole bunch of stuff at it uh, and try it out, you'll get some problems in your code, which is exactly what we want. Um, we want to find all the problems that we could run into uh, before we run into them. Uh, that way we can make sure that our code works exactly the way that we want it to. So is anyone still working on getting here? Okay, so now that one of our unit tests failed, the first question that we have to ask is, which one failed? Um, so the same way that we have details in our console when we have problems, like when we said hello world over here, editor tests will give us a little bit more about what failed and where it failed. So it says it failed in RGB to HSV. We expected 300, but got negative 60. Um, and if you uh, look at it real quick, you might say, hey, 300 and negative 60, that's like those bo both add up to 360. Um, except one's like 360 away from the other one. Uh, so one of our test cases gave us this negative 60 when we expected a 300. But which one did it? Uh, it said at color conversion unit tests dot RGB to HSV, huge long line, and then 45. And 45 is all we really need to know. So let me set on, I think I could put line numbers here, but maybe not. Um, so the one that we're talking about, if you don't have lines on, is this one. This line is the culprit. That's the one that failed. It is the bad line. And if we look at it, we can say we expected 300, and the only time we expect 300 for hue is in magenta. So that means magenta does not work with our current HSV function. Um, so this is the part where we do a lot of like super deep investigation and figure out what the problem is. So if we go back to our color conversion class, it's in RGB to HSV. It's somewhere in how we calculate the hue. We're ending up with negative 60 when we really want uh, 300. And our test case that we can try it on is magenta with red one blue zero, and uh, sorry, red one, green zero, and blue one. 
So if we look at this and we say, okay, we find the max, we find the min, we find the difference between them. The max of these is gonna be one, the min of these is gonna be zero, the difference is gonna be one. Then we say, if our delta is approximately zero, which it's not, it's one. So skip over this. Otherwise, if our max is approximately equal to our red, which it is, because red is one and our max is one, so we'll use this one, and we'll say return 60 times g minus b over delta. And our g is zero, and our b is one, so that's negative one over delta, which is one, which is negative one times 60. That's where our negative 60 is coming from. So this will still give us the sort of right answer, but it'll be in a negative range instead of a positive one. So really easy way we can fix this. We can just say h equals h plus 360 mod 360. Don't want to handle them. This will make it so if we end up with a negative value, we just add 360 to it. And if we had a positive value, we won't go beyond 360. So go ahead, add that one line in. Should be pretty easy to type up, pretty easy to understand. And then when we go back to our editor, it'll think for a little bit. Our unit test will turn a little bit darker because it's been edited. And when we run it, yay, our unit tests are all green again, which means that all of our unit tests pass with flying colors now that we've fixed our color conversion. So we now have one of our Unity editor tests passing, which is great we can convert RGB to HSV, but we also want to go back. So we're going to write another test for HSV to RGB. Same way we did the first one. So this will be your unit test for HSV to RGB. Kind of the opposite of what we did before. Instead of starting with an RGB and getting our HSV from it, then checking it against what we have in our HSV array, we're going to start with three HSVs. We're going to make an RGB from it and test that against what we have in our RGB array. So if we wrote our code perfectly, this should just compile and give us a clean unit test. So we've got another gray circle, run all, and it works great. To give a quick recap of where we are, we now have an RGB to HSV function and an HSV to RGB function, and we are pretty confident that it works perfectly both ways. We tested it with our inputs from RGB to HSV and then back, and we ended up at the same place we were before. So awesome. Now we get to use it. Uh, so we're gonna move on to a new kind of editor tool. This is how to use Unity's editor windows. So uh, your hierarchy, your scene, your game, asset store if you have it open, inspector, project, console, all this stuff, these are all Unity's editor windows. Uh, and we can make our own because Unity gives us that, those sort of capabilities really easy right inside of uh, C Sharp. So let's go ahead and make a new C Sharp script, and we'll call it Color Picker Window. Make sure that it's inside your editor folder, because this is also part of our editor scripting.
All right, so we'll start off with using Unity Engine and Unity Editor. And then we'll make a new class called Color Picker Window. And we'll make this an editor window. So all we have to do to make our own windows is to make a class inherit from editor window. Uh, Unity will pick up on it automatically with a couple more hints. Uh, but we put all of our code inside of here. So uh, if you've ever used Adobe Color uh, ever, well, I'll open that up real quick. Color cooler, I'm not completely sure. So this sort of thing where you can like drag around central color and you can get like these analogous colors, monochromatic, triad, complementary, all this cool stuff. So we want to be able to do this uh, with our editor window. We want to be able to give it this color and have it find some more for us. So uh, we'll need a color to go for. So we'll start by making that a member. What was that? So we'll start out with a private color. We'll also have a float called separation. And this separation is just this amount, this angle between our first and our base uh, analogous colors. And that'll be in degrees, because uh, we want to modify our hue by that. So after we've got those, then we want to be able to open our window. So we need to make something with the tag of menu item. And we'll give it an item name. And this will tell Unity both where to put it and what to call it. So we'll put it under the window tab and we'll call it color picker. So now I've got an initializer function. This will actually open our window for us using Unity's editor tools. So all we have to type is So now we've asked it, hey, editor window, can you get us a window of the color picker window type and then give it back to us? And once we've got that, then we just want to call window.show, which is an internal function that will say, hey, pop this tab up on the screen and start it displaying in Unity. Pretty easy. Um, but there will be nothing inside our window yet. But we can still try it out. So I'll give it like a minute or so to get that all typed out since it's pretty long. Question? Kind of. Um, so the way that init works is this menu item tag right here will make a menu option appear in the window uh, color picker spot in the Unity uh, toolbar up at the top. And when it's actually clicked, it'll call this init function. So that's why it's static instead of being a member function. Um, so when we click it, it calls init, init gets a window and shows it. Everyone got that? Okay. Okay. So now that we've got that all typed up, if we go window, Look at that. We have a color picker option in here now. And when we open it up, we get a tab that's super boring and it has nothing in it, uh, which we have to change because we want it to do stuff. But we do have a window, so that's a start. So our next thing that we're going to do is we're going to write our onGUI function. So this onGUI function gets called every single time that the editor decides to repaint your window, which means draw all of its controls and its text and its contents. So uh, 
in our OnGUI, we're going to be uh, making a color selector so that we can pick a base color, giving a float selector so that we can pick that separation angle, uh, and then we're going to provide uh, a bunch of different sets of colors. So uh, it, Unity has it set up so we can do it pretty easily. So we'll start with color equals Editor GUI layout, which will be a great class if you plan on doing a lot of editor tools GUI stuff. Dot color field, and then we pass it a label as a string, and then we can pass it a color. So we'll call it base color, and we'll pass in color. So what this basically does is you give it a color, and then it'll give you back what the user input for it. That way you can provide a sort of default for it, and you can track what the last color the user input was. We'll do the same for separation. This time we want a float field. So go ahead to get, get that all typed out. I'm trying to make this a little bit farther over. And when we go back to Unity, we'll get our base color and our separation, just like in a regular old editor. So I'll pull this over a little bit. So is everyone here? Is this someone not here? Cool. So. Now that we've got this base color, let's go ahead and like pick something. Look at that, we picked something, wow. But it doesn't do anything, so it's not cool yet. Um, we can change our separation too, but that also doesn't do anything. So that's not cool yet either. So let's do stuff. Uh, so we're gonna be using a little bit of space, so we're gonna go space. It gives us a little bit of vertical space before our next thing that we put out. All right, and then our next thing, instead of getting something from the user, we just want to display something. So we'll just show a color, and this will be an analogous color. So we want to do an analogous color, but first we need to know what our HSV values are. So let's make some floats to put our HSV into. And then we'll call color conversion dot RGB to HSV on our color. And we'll put it into our HSV. So now we've got the HSV values for our color that the user gave us. And the color that we want to display for our analogous colors are going to be uh, two times our separation forward, one times then one back, and then two back. So we're really just going to adjust our hue by our separation. So we'll call color conversion dot HSV to RGB. And for our H, we're going to do H plus two times separation, SV. Then we're just going to take this line and copy it a few times. So now we've got four. We want to do that plus one, then that minus one, and then that minus two. So let's give it a little bit of title two. We'll make a label analogous colors. So what we did was we got our HSV for our color that the user gave us, give us a little bit of space, label analogous colors, and then show four colors which should be analogous using the separation they provided us as well. 
So, now that we've got our analogous colors working, which we should, but let's double check Unity just in case. Can never be too sure. So we've got our analogous colors. They all look pretty red right now. Let's up that. Now we get a pretty color spectrum. We can go ahead and like change this. Woo, rainbow. Super awesome. Can increase our separation and our analogous colors will get farther away or closer. So pretty cool. Uh, our analogous colors are all working. Now we can go and do something else. So what's next that color has? Monochromatic. So for monochromatic, we're gonna be adjusting our value. Our saturation is gonna stay the same, but we're gonna adjust our value. Uh, so let's get three more monochromatic colors in there. So the same way we have this, we'll just make another one, some more space. This one will be monochromatic colors. And then we're just going to do the same sort of thing. This time, we're going to leave the hue the same. Our saturation, we're going to multiply by 0.75. And our value is going to stay the same. And then do that two more times. This one's going to be 0.5. This one's going to be 0.25. So almost the same as our one that we did last time, but now instead of changing the hue, we're going to be changing the saturation. That'll give us a bunch of monochromatic colors. Oh, I'm sorry, I messed up. This should be value. That's for if we want to get progressively grayer. OK, so that's the one that you want with adjusting value over time. So I'll pull this off to the side, leave the important bit up, and when we go back to Unity, we now have our monochromatic colors. If we play around with that, you can see it gives us some more monochromatic shades, depending on what we change our color to. Awesome. So I guess we'll do maybe one or two more, and then we'll quit, because colors are boring. They were super cool at the beginning, but now they're boring, because we've done so much of them. So we've got analogous, monochromatic, we've got triad, and complementary next. So let's do those two. So triad, I will do, and then complementary, I'll let you guys do, because self-directed learning and stuff. So add some space, make a label. This one's going to be triad, make a color, color conversion again, HSV to RGB. Our triad is going to be our original color, that plus 120 degrees, and that minus 120 degrees. So that plus 120 degrees. and that minus 120 degrees. So we'll make those. And when we try them out in Unity, our triad will show up. So if we start on pure red, our triad will be green and blue, just like you would expect, one third away around the color wheel. And if we change it, we'll slowly get different triads. Awesome. So go ahead and do complementary colors. Um, complementary colors, just to show you what color does, looks like this. Our complementary color is this one all the way across to the other side. So go ahead and try it out. See what fits your fancy. We pull it in, 
doesn't really come any closer, but we can do that if we want. Now that everyone's got that working, awesome, great job. Complementary colors, also not very difficult. Just that. This is 180 now. This is complementary. Then when we go to Unity, it'll show up down here as our complementary color. So now we've got all this great stuff we can modify our color however we want. Separation for analogous colors. Awesome. You just did everything Justin did over break. <laughs> um, so cool. Now you have a pretty good grip of how to make some GUI in Unity, how to use its editor windows. Um, super cool. Our next thing that we're going to be doing is going to be using custom editors. So. In the time that we have left, which is roughly 40 minutes, I'll try to go as quickly as possible. And if I go too fast, I'll put the files up so that you guys can try them out and play with them. Let's make a tile editor. Um, so we want to be in 2D. We don't want this skybox to show up. So let's just go here and turn off skybox. And right there, no skybox, thanks. Um, if you have your skybox, you can hit, oh, sorry, that's lighting. Go here to this little picture frame and then click skybox. And I'll turn your skybox off. So you get it nice and gray, just the way you like it. So we're going to make a new game object. And this is going to be our tile map. Uh, we'll put this at the origin, just like that. And now we need a component for it. So not in your editor folder, right outside in Unity. Let's make a new C-sharp script and call it tile map. It made some code for us, so now we can go in here. When we reload, unavailable, gotta reload it. We'll reopen it. No, I got it. So now we've got our tile map here, fills it with some basic stuff for us. We won't need this quite yet. Um, so our tile map's gonna be real simple. We're just gonna have a bunch of tiles all over the place. Each tile's gonna be some prefab game object. It's gonna be at some X and some Y coordinate. We're gonna place them pretty standardly so that they fit inside the little gray squares in Unity. Uh, so first things first, let's go and make a dictionary for our tiles. Because we want to place them all over the place, uh, we'll just use a dictionary for this. So, enhance. <laughs> we'll make this a string to um, a game object. This will be our tiles. Uh, we need to make this so it's dot generic. Okay, so we've got our string to game object. The string is just going to be something like. X comma Y, like that. So let's go ahead and make a quick function for that. Uh, chord to key for an X and Y. And we'll just return X plus comma plus Y. So now we can just give that our X and Y coordinates that we want to use. It'll give us back the key that we should use for it in the dictionary. So let's make a place function. We want to place some game object at an X and Y, so. So we take in our X, Y, and our tile. Question? Yeah. String, sorry about that. So we want to place a tile. So uh, first things first, we should make sure that we don't have anything there. So let's do remove tile, and this one should, if we already have a tile at some location, find it, get rid of it, destroy it. Um, for remove tile, uh, normally we would call gameObject.destroy, but since we're going to be calling this from the editor, we want to use a slightly different one called destroy immediate, 
So when you see that, that's why uh, it's because we're in the editor. So we'll get our key. Get our key like that. And then if our key is inside our dictionary, then we want to remove it. So we want to destroy immediate tiles key. And then we want to remove it. So remove tile will work great. Now we want to do it in place tile. So first we want to remove it if there's a tile there. Then we want our key as well. So we get our key for it. And then we want to actually make a new game object, put it at that, at that location, and make sure that it's a child of the current tile map game object that this component is on. So let's make a new game object, new tile. We'll instantiate it. So now we have a new tile. Let's go ahead and give it the correct coordinates. So we'll make a new vector 3, and we'll say x, y, 0. And its rotation will be the identity rotation. Got to make sure that this is a game object. So we'll just cast it. Now we've got our new tile. Let's make sure that it's a child of our current game object. So we just set its parent to our own transform. That'll make sure that it appears under us in the inspector. And when we move our tile map, it'll move all the tiles that we've made for it. It will also allow us to twirl our tile map closed so we don't have to look at every single tile that we've created. And last but not least, we need to add it to our map. So so we just set that to new tile. So cool. This should work for placing and removing tiles. The more complicated part of it is actually getting it to go nicely from picking a tile on the screen with your mouse to placing it uh, when we click or when we drag or anything like that. So that part of the code is a lot more complicated and we're going to start doing that in just a moment once everyone's gotten a chance to try that out. Any questions while we're reading? Besides, why am I doing this? Good. So let's get moving on to the next part, because we've only got a little bit of time left. I don't want to leave you hanging without a tile map editor. Super basic, but a little one. And the next bit of code is going to be pretty dense, so keep your eyes peeled. So let's go into our editor folder again. And here we're going to make a new C-sharp script. And we're going to call it tile map editor, just like that. Once we've got that, go back to Visual Studio. Normalize your line endings if you want. So now we've got this class, which we are going to almost completely gut and rewrite. So let's go ahead and start from the top. Let's keep using Unity Engine. As you might have guessed, we're going to want to use Unity Editor since we put it inside of our editor folder. But now we're going to use a new tag called Custom Editor. So this class that we're going to write is going to be a custom editor for our tile map. So we've made this new tile map editor class, and we've said it's an editor, and specifically an editor for the tile map that component that we made. So here, we're going to go ahead, and we'll do something pretty simple. Um, we're going to start sort of in the middle of it, and we're going to say public override void on inspector GUI. And here, we're just going to put 
label field, hello world, right in there. So normally, our tile map component, when we add it to something, would show up pretty empty, which we can oop, zoom in, enhance. So you don't have to do this, but if I comment this out so that nothing actually happens, even though we have it, and go back to Unity, and I add my tile map to it, you'll see it shows up like a regular old empty component. But when I add this editor to the assets folder and go back, I'm selecting multiple things. It'll say hello world right there, which is what we want because that's what we told it to do in our inspector GUI. So we'll need two variables inside of our editor. We'll need the tile map, and we'll need the game object, which is our current tile. We call that current tile. Um, we'll want to pick our current tile inside of our inspector GUI, so we can just do current tile is game object. Layout dot object field. We want like the fourth overload, I think, which is going to be current tile, then our object, then type of game object, and then false because we don't want to allow any stuff in the scene to be given us as our current tile. We'll add one more function uh, besides on inspector GUI, which is going to be called on enable. If you've played around with Unity for a bit, you've probably heard of on enable before. Um, normally, it's called uh, the very first time that your component is loaded, I think. I'm not completely sure when. Yeah. Like on the, at the beginning. Yeah. So it. Yeah. So it's called when your object is enabled um, by like clicking or unchecking the checkbox. Um, and it's also called once at the very beginning of your scene load uh, because it sort of like enables at the start of the scene. Yeah. Uh, if it's not enabled, it won't get enabled initially. Um, unenabled is something different for editors. Uh, unenable is called when you click on a component that can be edited by your editor. Uh, and it says, hey, I have a component that you need to edit. So in on enable, we'll set tile map to this mysterious target, which is set for us. That's the component that we're editing. And we'll set current tile to null. And we can change that in our inspector GUI. So now we've got our current tile. Super awesome. If we go back to Unity, instead of our hello world, we'll now get this current tile. So before we go forward, let's make a real basic tile. So all we have to do is make a cube, add it to your project, name it like basic tile. Then nuke it, because uh, we don't want it in our scene anymore. We have a prefab for it. This is what we're going to be giving to it as our current tile. It's going to be what we instantiate off of. So we could put it here, but we can't do anything with it yet. So now we get to do a deep dive into some super crazy code, which is going to need a lot of explanation. So bear with me for a while. So now we have this on scene GUI function. This is called when we want to draw stuff in our actual scene view. So we can do a whole bunch of stuff in here. We can do pretty much whatever we want. Uh, for an example, I'll just draw something pretty basic. Uh, so I'll just draw a line um, using handles. Handles is what we'll be using for drawing everything. If you're used to drawing lines, you've probably used debug.drawline before. 
We use handles, but when we draw that, hey, look, there's our line. Exactly the same as we expected it to be. So you can sort of tell handles are the way that we're going to be drawing stuff. So if we want to make a tile selector, really that's just four lines around the border of the tile. So we'll be using handles to draw those four lines. So the first thing that we want to do is be able to get some input uh, from the user. So uh, Unity has an event system that you pretty much only need to use for uh, editors. So we're going to get the current event, which is like a mouse click or drag, scroll wheel, uh, typing keys, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and we'll also need a control ID. So this line is pretty confusing, but this control ID is basically a way for us to say, I am just one editor inside Unity. So when we start our on-scene GUI, you say, hey, I need a control ID because I am going to be something that the user can interact with in the scene view. We get that by calling GUIUtility.getControlID. This will give us the same thing every single frame. Uh, and we tell it we have focus type passive. That means that instead of only activating when the user's cursor gets near to us or uh, one of our handles, that we'll always get, be able to get input from the user. So we get our control ID, which we need to interact with Unity. And then we'll switch our type of our event E, which is the current event. And we have to handle one special case, which is the layout. And we'll call handle.utility. Add default control for control ID. So what this does is it takes our control ID that we have, and we need at least one handle for it. So we'll give it a default uh, control uh, handle, which is basically like saying we can interact with the user. We'll tell uh, Unity how we're interacting with them. So we'll leave that for now. We'll just say break on default. So now for some vector algebra. Um, because we want to be able to trans translate where the user's cursor on the screen is to some tile coordinates, we need to do some crazy math. Um, so it won't be super complicated, but it'll be a little bit dense. So we'll start with our world point. And that's going to be camera.current.screen to world point. And we're going to start with new vector 3, our mouse position x, and then our negative mouse position y plus camera.current dot pixel height. All right, so this line, pretty dense. We're getting a world point in, this, in the scene, and we're getting it by saying, get our current camera, which is our scene view camera, and get me a world point based on a screen point that I give you. Uh, and then we're going to give it a screen point by passing it our mouse position x from our event, because our current event contains the user's mouse position. And then because our mouse position's y is measured from the top down, and we need to give it coordinates in bottom up, we take the current pixel height of the camera and subtract our mouse position's y. So this is how we get a world point. Again, just sort of bear with me for a while. So now we're going to call, we're going to find our normal point, which is going to be the point in space uh, relative to our tile map. 
So we're going to call tile map transform world to local matrix dot multiply point. So since we already have a world point, that's what we're going to pass in. And this will get us a point local to our tile map. So we can spin it around, transform it, move it around, and our GUI will still work uh, relative to our tile map. And then to get our X and Y, super simple. Floor to int. Our X and Y is the same. So now we have, through lots of vector algebra, figured out what our X coordinate and Y coordinate for our tile is. Um, now we can actually start using this. Uh, so let's draw a box around it because we need some interactivity. We've been programming for like 10 or 12 lines already. So let's draw some stuff with our handles. So let's just draw a line starting from x, y to x plus 1, y. And then we'll just duplicate these lines a couple times and make a box out of it. So we'll start at the line across the bottom. Then we'll do the line up the side, the right hand side. Then we'll do the line across the top. And finally, we'll do the line down the left-hand side. When you have this typed up, if you have it typed up, you should see this box that stays in one place. But when you drag it using right-click, it goes to where your mouse is, which is awesome. Except I want it to follow me around all the time. And shouldn't it be doing that anyway? Because we have it in scene GUI. Um, so this is a bit of a uh, non-intuitive little quirk. Uh, even though it's inside of our onscene GUI function, onscene GUI only gets called when you need to update the scene. Uh, and when it's staying still, you don't really need to update your scene. Uh, and it would be a waste of resources for Unity to redraw absolutely everything uh, except when you needed to redraw it because you like moved the view around or something. So you can fix that with one easy line, scene view, dot repaint all. This is kind of not the best way to do it, but it's good enough and you won't really have any suffering from it either. So go ahead and type that in, and then when you move your mouse around, you should get the box to follow it. All right, so to try this out, just go to Unity, Wait for it to refresh a bit. Then put your basic tile into your current tile and click. And if you're not lucky, you'll get this no reference exception with remove tile. So let's find out what happened with our code. It's in tile map 28. I can't tell which line this is because I don't have line numbers on. Okay, 28 right here. So our problem is tiles.contains key gave us a no reference exception, which it should because tiles isn't initialized yet. So we need to add two quick things. We need to say initialized, and this is going to be a property. And we'll just say if tiles is not null, we're initialized. And we'll make a function called initialize that says tiles is a new dictionary. So now that we can check if we're initialized and initialize ourselves in our editor, when we get our target, we also want to call if not tilemap.initialized, tilemap.initialize. Yep. Let's put this over here. So 
if we go back to Unity, clear our stuff, let's give it our basic tile again. And when we click, it creates our tile at the wrong location, but it does create our tile. And we can start building from here. This is a pretty easy fix to get it centered on our tile. All we have to do is just change it. So instead of place tile giving it x and y, x plus 0.5 and y plus 0.5. So now when we go back, you may notice that some bad stuff happens. Like these stay, but if I click again, should make another one. Oops, I gotta put my tile in. It'll make another one, which we could see because it showed up in the inspector. And that's not great. We don't want that to happen. This is, if you've ever heard me talk about Unity serialization, this is because Unity doesn't serialize our dictionary that we are using for our tiles. So you can go through and delete all your old tiles and start making new ones. And we have pretty basic tile editor now. Cool. So that's all for today. Thanks for coming, everyone. I'll put this code up online for everyone who uh, wasn't able to make it, both the provided code and the finished project. So what was that? All the code? That's it. That's the whole workshop. Thanks for coming out, everyone.